The Colts had an awesome performance on Sunday, but there are still some grueling decisions they're going to need to make moving forward. We'll dive into that and more on today's episode of Locked On Colts. Let's get to it. You are Locked On Colts, your daily Indianapolis Colts podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you all for tuning in and making us your number one listen of the day. This is your daily podcast covering your Indianapolis Colts, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs, which are the most comfortable shorts, pants, and sweatpants with built-in liners. Go to birddogs.com, use promo code Locked On, and boom, a free Bird Dogs rope hat with your pair of Bird Dogs. This is Jake Arthur, joined by the beaming, proud papa of the Alec Pierce Hive, Zach Hicks. You guys know the two of us from HorseshoeHuddle.com. Uh, today, we're going to bring you the latest news and notes following the Colts' 34-27 win over the Jags on Sunday, as well as some of these tough choices and good problems that the Colts have to kind of get sorted out ahead of them. Uh, first and foremost, let's do a little housekeeping. Uh, the Colts made some practice squad moves today. They signed wide receiver Vincent Smith and tight end Jailer Weidermeyer to the practice squad, and they released tight end Nakia Griffin-Stewart from the practice squad. Now, Zach, if I remember correctly, Weidermeyer was one of, he was either one of your guys or he was a Build-A-Ballard, was he not? I don't think he was a Build-A-Ballard because, I think he was up until the Combine. The combine yes, he had a terrible <laughs> Combine, that's how I remember now, yeah. So, Weidermeyer right. was a lot of people's tight end one going into the draft, mm-hmm. like, like, you know, all off season or all during the season. And then that combine happened. He ran like a five ten, like 40 yard oh. dash. Like it was, it was, it was very, uh, to run your Wilson esque. If you guys are big draft nerds like me, if you could remember back to that day, mm-hmm. uh, just, just a brutal, brutal combine. And, uh, and he ended up, I think he went undrafted. Uh, he spent some time with the bills, uh, this off season. I think the Cowboys as well. I think he spent time with the Cowboys, but, yeah, I mean, if he could just be a blocking tight end, that's what the Colts need desperately right now. So I wouldn't mind seeing him up if he is ready to be a blocking tight end. And then the other guy, Vincent Smith, uh, I think he's like a four or five year vet who's been, uh, I think, with Houston uh, recently. Special teams guy uh, with Kiki Cootie going down, uh, which we're going to talk about in a second. Uh, mm. You know, they kind of need another special teams guy. And with Ashton Doolin also out right now. So. Uh, you know, just just some minor moves on the practice squad, nothing too flashy. But yeah, you know, if you guys are draft nerds, Jalen Weidermeyer was uh, <laughs> was was definitely someone that everybody loved uh, early in the process last year. Yeah, Monday was your day, draft nerds. Yeah. Uh, and then so um, Frank Reich gave his normal Monday afternoon uh, presser with the media, kind of filled us in on a lot of thing, a little bit of things. Always gives us injury updates, whatnot. You mentioned Kiki QT. He had that nasty collision on the punt return yesterday. Uh, he's in the concussion protocol. He's probably going to miss Sunday. Of course, that was an ugly one. Um, that wasn't, I mean, as far as personnel goes, that's not like huge for the Colts. QT was out there because Naheem Hines had his own concussion and missed the game. Uh, we don't know what the practice report looks like yet. They don't get started till Wednesday. So no idea what Hines availability is going to be like. Uh, but was there anything else that Frank said today that, that stuck out to you? It, you know, the, pretty much the rest of it was him digesting the uh, the game film. Yeah, yeah, they were talking about the game film. And I know a lot of reporters, you know, it's funny. I, I love beat reporters to death. Like, I think they do an invaluable job. And I know you're kind of like one too, Jake, the way that you yeah. <laughs> do a lot of the report stuff. And Tread like, lightly. You're, you're close. <laughs> you're close there, Jake. You're close. But, but um, I love beat reporters because you can always tell when they have an article coming because they'll singularly yes. ask about like one player. Like I saw a question there that was like, what do you have to say about Grover Stewart lately? And I'm like, okay, here comes a Grover Stewart article by whoever, mm. whoever asked that. But, yeah. I um, always know it because that, that person will ask like four or five different people about that exact yep. topic. And it's, you know, you know what's coming. <laughs> yep. uh, but there were some really good questions I think in there. And, and uh, they're usually by Joel Erickson. Cause I can always tell that, yeah, Frank will always say like, Oh, Joel, like, Oh, I know you're yeah. asking me Joel and stuff like that. But one that um, I'm not sure who asked this question was a lot about like the no huddle game and stuff like that, that the Colts were, were peppering that no huddle in, in the game mm-hmm. on Sunday. And, 
yeah, Frank Reich said that it, it, it was a way to kind of keep the pressure off the offensive line and also kind of use the passing game to be the run game. And I'm, I'm going to have an article here. You know, you guys are listening to this Tuesday morning, uh, so my article probably is already out. But I'm going to post an article here um, in a few here on Monday night about how the Colts basically use the pass game as the run game. They pass the ball on 43 of 59 first and second down plays uh, this, this past game, which is over 70% of the first down plays, uh, nearly six yards per per pass attempt on those plays uh, for 254 yards. So, and if and you, you said that was on first downs, first and second down, first and oh, second okay. down. So if you compare yeah, if that, been, yeah, no, well, if you compare that yards, to the, yeah. yeah, yeah. If you compare that to the last two games, the last two games, uh, the Colts tried to run the ball a lot on first and second down, you know, 43 attempts on 107 uh, first and second downs. Right. And th- this is the Broncos game and the Titans game. So they were trying to run in. They kept running into a brick wall they only had um, 107 total yards on those 43 carries, uh, which is – oh, no, my fault, my fault. They had 125 yards on those 43 carries for 2.9 yards per carry. So the Colts really went into this game saying, we need to throw the ball on first and second down, stay ahead of the sticks. And the no-huddle game was kind of what led to that. That's why uh, Frank Reich was going to huddle, why there were so many quick passes, and they were getting more yards on first and second down. And as a result, we saw the best, uh, you know, the best offensive output of the year. So uh, I know that was a lot of word salad there. I'm throwing out there. My article will make a lot more sense. Go to horseshoehuddle.com and read it. Uh, but yeah, no, the Colts switched up. They did not keep running the running into a brick wall. We didn't see those second and ten or second and twelve just runs into the back of offensive linemen for for one yard gain. Oh, we yeah. saw passes for three, four, five, six yards that led to more success on third down and why the Colts were so good on third down. So. Uh, I'm glad that whoever asked that question uh, of Frank Reich and the presser uh, brought that one up. But uh, the other thing I wanted to to kind of talk about a little bit here, uh, which we're going to talk about more in one of our later segments, is uh, they did talk about Julian Blackman uh, in in the presser uh, and how Julian Blackman was close to playing. But I think I think Frank said that like he did like his ankle wasn't responding well at the end of the week. I, I think that's what he said, right, Jake? Uh, basically, he he didn't kind of take that curve and make the progress at the end of the week they were thinking. So he was in there in an emergency situation, basically. Right. Right. And so Ronnie Thomas, the second got just another start and another full mm-hmm. game. I don't think Julian Blackman even touched the field. So I thought that was super interesting because, you know, we were kind of expecting Julian Blackman to come back at least in some degree this week. And he just, you know, was obviously just there for emergency, but we'll talk about it here in segment three about what do the Colts even do at safety when he's back? Right. Like, it, it really could go either way, but uh, yeah, no, a lot of a lot of coach speak, obviously, from Frank Reich today uh, with his with his presser. But uh, again, it was a good win, and I, I really like the no huddle stuff. I, I love I love when reporters and beat guys uh, use these pressers to really dive into game plan stuff because we don't really get that insight. Like, yeah, we can get a coach saying like, ah, Rodney McLeod is awesome, or Grover Stewart is awesome. Like, yeah, we can get that. You know, we, we expect that, you know, that's their player. Mm-hmm. But when you could talk about game plan, like why you had success, uh, I always love that stuff. And and the no huddle insight uh, was really good from Frank. Yeah. And he was also asked about if they plan to use that more going forward, because even going back to like Andrew Luck stuff, I feel like I feel like up tempo was what unlocked the offense with Luck and Reich in, in that one year. Uh, but he basically said it, it'll be a week to week thing. They don't know yet. Um Basically, it's just what they had to do this time around. But who knows if, if we'll con- continue to see it at a more uh, consistent level. Hopefully, it's not just a thing where they're trying to dig themselves out of a huge hole. Right. Um, but yeah, that, that was kind of the theme of the day was uh, was all that. Yeah, they talked, like you said, talked about Grover. <laughs> um, shoot, yeah. And a lot of it is just kind of guys who are out and how they're going to approach because they talked about Paris Campbell and and things like that. So, yeah, again, we'll dive into more of that later. Uh, The Colts obviously look pretty comfortable against Jacksonville. And, you know, they always say when you look good, you play good. You guys may not have a game to play in, but I can tell you all about how that you can look good. Fellas, it's sweatpants season and Bird Dogs is getting in on the action. You can find me posted up in my sweats from about October through March, and my bird dogs are top in the rotation. They're crazy comfortable, and they give you good range of motion if you got to move around a little bit. Fall temps don't stop me from doing things like golfing or grilling, so these pants are a must in those situations. Dudes, the ladies have their yoga pants, so it's time for us to get our own thing going. 
Bird Dogs joggers are higher quality than Lululemon and 20 bucks less. So what are we even talking about here? Go buy some Bird Dogs. If you're not a pants wearer and you're that guy that wears shorts out in January, they've got you covered. It doesn't matter if it's Florida or 10 degrees in the Northeast. They have their signature shorts with the built-in liners. It's the most comfortable shorts in existence. Go to birddogs.com, enter the promo code Locked On, and they'll throw in a free Bird Dogs rope hat. That's birddogs.com, promo code Locked On, and boom, a free Bird Dogs rope hat. You can see it right there on your screen. Uh, and that's with your your pair, your new pair of Bird Dogs. They're the most comfortable shorts, pants, and sweatpants with the built-in liners. You will not take these things off. I promise you. And guys, our show is also brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. Employers, create a job post to attract the best candidates and then add the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you are hiring. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. Every year it seems like uh, these teams in the NFL get a player back from injury late in the season or makes a key trade to help their team finish strong. The workplace can be the, just exactly the same. Uh, find a ringer to add to your team and close out the year strong. LinkedIn Jobs is rated number one by small businesses in delivering those quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, Jake, let's have the very uh, <laughs> uncomfortable conversation. You know, I think everyone wants to talk super positive about this offensive line because Four out of these five starters played really well. Okay, four out of the five guys who played a majority of the game played really well. Yeah. I, I guess <laughs> Dennis Kelly technically did not start, but when he came in at left tackle, it, it's like a, a burden was lifted off the Colts' shoulders. They all of a sudden mm. could pass the ball. They could move the ball. Dennis Kelly was the answer to all of our prayers, apparently. Uh, but even with this this great – I don't even want to say great this, – this adequate game from the offensive line where the Colts could actually throw the ball – there was still one starter that was playing really poorly out there. Uh, pro Football Focus rated right guard Matt Pryor, uh, I think, with a 21 pass pro grade. If you guys don't know how Pro Football Focus works, uh, 60 is below average. I think 70 to 80 is like average to good, and anything above that's great. Matt Pryor was a 21 in pass protection. So, you know, and, and if you look at the rest of the grades on there, for the Colts offensive linemen, they were all like in the 60s, 70s, 80s, like really, really good games across the board. Uh, but again, Matt Pryor was the big struggle point in pass protection. We even saw on the big touchdown pass to Alec Pierce, uh, Matt Pryor was beat like a drum and, and it led yeah. to Matt Ryan getting hit low. You know, it took a really nasty hit as he delivered that big pass to Alec Pierce. So Jake, I mean, I feel like we've talked about this a lot the last couple of weeks, but like it's got to be time to bench Matt Pryor, right? Like I, I know this was a successful win and it's hard to make a bench like that after a big win, but like, man, Matt Pryor is just killing this team in both the run and pass game the last couple of weeks. Yeah. And that's, that's really rough because it's, he was the second option or really third option. They've tried at right guard so far. It's like, there's only one spot so far. They can't figure out. They've got some sort of option everywhere else. I'm not real sure what to do, but if you stick Dennis Kelly out there at left tackle and keep him out there, I mean, they've talked about rotation and getting guys reps, whatever. If you keep it with Dennis Kelly, you know, maybe Ryman is the next guy that you start at right guard. But if he's your long-term guy you want at left tackle, then, you know, you're taking away those reps. So it's really just, it, it's, it's just a, a crappy situation because it's one position on the line that they just can't get right. So, I don't know. I, I applaud their willingness to shuffle things up on the line, though. But, man, and, and especially quarterback as well, I'll say. You know, Sam Ellinger in there over Nick Foles is the backup now. It's not a thing of Ellinger beat Foles, but it's just Ellinger can do things that Foles can't. So they don't want to have three quarterbacks active on game day. So just bringing in Ellinger for some special packages, which we've yet to see. But, 
yeah, that, that's a tough one. There, there'll be there. There's some more, uh, more tough choices that they're going to have on offense moving forward. Yeah, yeah, it's weird to me. I think the Colts. I think they do a lot of things right, and they do play the hot hand at times. But when it comes to a guy they've signed in free agency or like someone they're spending decent money on, they always seem kind of reluctant to bench them. You know, we saw with Eric Fisher last year where surprisingly Matt Pryor was outplaying him down the stretch. And then it still led to Eric Fisher getting more time once Eric Fisher was healthier, once, you know, their, the injuries were cleared up. Um, you know, it always seems that, that the fault goes to the guy with more money. So Matt Pryor, probably when he's deserved to get benched the last couple of weeks, has just kind of been moved around uh, all over the place. And now he's sitting at right guard and still struggling. Uh, I don't know. For me personally, I'd probably still want to throw like Will Fries back out there again. I, I think – Will Fries did not yeah. play great in his one start, but he was the only one where it's like, okay, he was going against Jeffrey Simmons. Like, he, he has an excuse for struggling in that first start. Not even that he really struggled that much. It's just, you know, he he did allow some some pressure up the middle from Jeffrey Simmons. But I'd probably go Fries or honestly, maybe look at the trade market or something or, or free agents. You know, Eric Flowers is out there who was a decent guard in Washington the last couple of years. Uh, maybe if you go to the trade market, you know, Chris Reed has been a healthy scratch all year for the for the Vikings. Like Chris Reed was awesome for this team last year. So mm-hmm. maybe you just call the Vikings and say, hey, you know, what what do you want for him? Because the Colts could desperately use him. But right now, I think their offensive line is on the right track. It's it's getting to a more passable level. But right guard is still a major issue. And Matt Pryor did not solve that whatsoever. Uh, but getting to more more positive stuff, you know, again, we, we're coming off victory, guys. I don't want to just harp on the negative stuff too much. A good problem the Colts have on offense is Deion Jackson. Deion Jackson was a guy that we talked about a lot this offseason, about like how he might not make the team. He's fumbling a lot in practice. He wasn't looking as good as Tyson Williams or Phillip Lindsay in practice, but the special teams mm-hmm. kept him around, and then he got his shot these last two weeks. And, you know, it's looked really good. I've been really impressed by Deion Jackson. Yeah, for sure. It's it's another one of those things where he looks really good. He looks like a legit player. Like he's not just doing well because they needed him to and was adequate. Like I think he's good enough to like have a role. And you know, you and I have been. You know, they're not going to move Naheem Hines to receiver, and I still don't think they do. <laughs> However, if they play him there more often, it will allow them to use Deion Jackson as that next running back role, or at least the next early down thing. It's what, kind of what they used to do with Jordan Wilkins. Like later in Wilkins tenure with the Colts, he had almost no offensive role unless he was needed. But occasionally before that, they would, they would give him some breadcrumbs here or there, you know, some, some carries occasionally. I think that's what they could do with Jackson uh, other than just on the wrong side of a blowout game or, or otherwise, but he's a great pass catcher as well. I don't know. I I can't recall what he's like in, in pass pro right now, but I think there's a role for him, honestly. Yeah, I think uh, I think the Jordan Wilkins role was was really well put there because I think what you could really do with him going forward, especially with, I mean, Jonathan Taylor's coming off an ankle injury, and I, I know fantasy football people are going to hate it, and they're going to, you know, <laughs> the, the, the world of fantasy football, it sucks. But honestly, who cares about fantasy football? It's all about getting wins, and – if the best case scenario going forward is maybe getting Taylor three series here and then Jackson comes in for one series after those three series and, you know, just go by that three by one split there. And then Hines obviously gets the end of the halves. Uh, I think that could be an effective way to kind of have a little bit of a committee here uh, and, and use these guys effectively. Again, take some of that pressure off Jonathan Taylor. Like, like we go back to that week one game against Houston where Jonathan Taylor was super effective, had a great game, but he got so many carries in that one and maybe that led to him getting worn down. I mean, even that Tennessee game where he got hurt, I mean, he was in the 20s of carries, and he was not very effective whatsoever. Uh, so maybe just getting another guy like Deion Jackson out there where, you know, Taylor is kind of – he's kind of a patient runner, and then when he sees his hole, he goes. Jackson is just a bowling ball. He's just going to roll forward and roll through guys like we saw in that touchdown run this past weekend. Mm-hmm. So maybe having that little bit of – uh, that little bit of thunder with JT's lightning and, you know, JT's lightning and thunder, obviously, but having just that guy who's, who's pure thunder, you know, it can be a nice way to kind of spell it. So I know everyone's scared of committee running backs, especially in the world of fantasy football, but uh, for the Colts, it might be a, a good way to, you know, maybe just get Deion Jackson maybe five to five, six, seven touches a game uh, because he's looking like a player that you don't want to just sit on the bench the rest of the year. Yeah. 
That's exactly right. And, you know, bef- before we wrap this up, I just want to chat real quick about tight end because, you know, you got, you got Kylan Granson doing some things. Jelani Woods is obviously coming on really well. The missing man other than one game has been Mo Alley Cox. Like, can you think of anything they've done with, with Mo Alley Cox other than that co- the couple weeks ago with the touchdowns? Like, it's, it's interesting if that, if anything develops with that, like, do you start to give Granson and, and Woods more run? Because it seems like the only guy whose trajectory keeps going up is Woods and his usage. Granson just kind of, I don't want to say afterthought, but he's he's not always used as much as maybe he could be. So I think that's another one that, that kind of bears monitoring. Yeah, the Molly Cox thing is interesting because he would still be getting all these snaps if he were as good a blocker this year as he was in years past. But we've seen a lot mm-hmm. this year where he... He was supposed to be the Jack Doyle type tight end for this team in, in mm-hmm. 2022. He was supposed to be the strong blocker, the underneath pass catcher, the reliable guy. And even though he's still kind of been the same in the pass catching department, like he's been fine uh, catching the ball, uh, it's just been the run game. It's been terrible for him this year. I, I you know, it kind of goes, you know, it goes for this whole offensive line and receivers. Everyone's been bad in run blocking this year. Uh, but Marley Cox was a guy that you expected to be a strong run blocker, and it's just not been there. So, until he starts picking up that run blocking, the Colts are going to still rely on the quick pass. And, and he's the third best of the passing game options, you know, when it comes to just pure ability. You know, Kylan Granson is a superb route runner, a guy who can get open and get quick separation. Jelani Woods is a specimen who can just run past guys and run over guys. Molly Cox is fine as a pass catcher, but mm. you're not going to play him over those two in a passing game. So until he starts showing his worth in the run game like he did in the past couple of years, there's really no reason for him to get 70, 80, 90% of the snaps. Yeah. I kind of feel an article coming from one of us on that one. Cause that, that, Probably. no one, no one's talking about that one yet, but I think we're going to need to keep an eye on it. Uh, but before we move on to defense, we know from experience that one of the defenses playing on Monday night might have to carry their team. So keep that in mind when making any of your picks. It's the Denver Broncos and Los Angeles Chargers on Monday Night Football this week. And a couple of picks I'm feeling are L.A. tight end Gerald Everett exceeding 32.5 receiving yards and Denver's Corliss Waitman going more than 4.5 punts. <laughs> <laughs> Placing picks on daily fantasy can get frustrating, but I love how easy it is on price picks, especially using the mobile app. I just pick my handful of players and I go on my merry way. Pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their projections, you can win up to 10 times your money. Prize Picks offers projections on any sport that you watch. Literally, it feels like everything. The big ones, the little ones, you might as well just go check because you could probably bet on whatever. Your entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. Withdrawals are safe and fast, and Prize Picks is currently operational in over 30 states and Canada. Download the Price Picks app or go to PricePicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First-time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code Locked On. If you deposit $100, Price Picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50, they'll give you $50. Don't forget to enter promo code Locked On at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. And before we get into our last segment here, guys, thanks again for making Locked On Colts your first listen every day. Make sure you also check out the NFL Key Predictions every Friday on Locked On NFL. Locked On's local experts give you the inside scoop on the five biggest games of the NFL weekend, including Sunday and Monday Night Football. Plus, betting advice from the field's leading experts bet online. Follow NFL Key Predictions every Friday on Locked On NFL, available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcast. I just noticed I did that little thing with my hand when I said bet online. That was <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jake, let's get to this defense here and let's let's start negative again. Like, you know, I, I, I'm feeling <laughs> I, I'm feeling spicy. Let's start negative. You know, Brandon, we made everyone feel way too good after yesterday's victory. <laughs> Brandon face on. Oh, man, mm. this hurts me as a Virginia Tech fan. Uh, Brandon face on was great there. And I actually didn't mind his film last year with the Raiders, but. We, we talked about this a little bit yesterday. When you're the big physical corner and you are struggling in the run game and you're getting out, you know, physically outmatched by receivers, what is giving you playing time over the young, athletic, small uh, playmaker? You know, Isaiah mm-hmm. Rogers is looking better in the run game. He's looking better in coverage. He's better, you know, he's more sure tackler and he's younger and he has more turnovers in his career. Like, there is absolutely zero reason why Brandon Faison should get more than 
five snaps a game at best. Like maybe it's just to spell some guys that they're tired. But I, I love Gus, what Gus Bradley's done this year. But this love affair with 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 Brandon Faison is eerily similar to the Al Qadim Muhammad stuff with Matt Eberflus. Yes. <laughs> and I, I like again, I love Brandon Faison. He's been a guy that I've liked for a long time. But it is time to give Isaiah Rogers almost every snap on the outside. Like Isaiah Rogers is that guy. Brandon Faison is not. Totally agree. And this was the, this was supposed to be the year that Rodgers had already earned that role and was going to step into that this year. New defense, I get Bradley and Ron Miles wanted to bring their guy in. It makes all the sense in the world, but it's not how the play has transpired. It's Isaiah Rodgers' time, absolutely. Um, and for all the exact reasons you just said. Um, but everyone is taking notice of this on online. Like Everybody. very very smart football people. I saw Darius Butler said something. All of us in the press box seem to say something. It's just so noticeable. Like there are enormous plays being given up by terrible effort or just terrible angles or like awful plays regard whatever it is. The uh, the attempt at making the play <laughs> failed spectacularly and resulted in something awesome for the opponent. And that's just not really something we've seen out of Isaiah Rogers in his few years so far. So it's not going to hurt you to get someone who's as much of a spark plug as him out there. It's time. And on Tuesday, you guys are going to be listening to this Tuesday. Uh, I can almost guarantee Gus is going to get asked about it. I mean, if, if I can be in on, on the thing and I don't have other stuff going on, I'll do it. I'm, but I, I know someone's going to ask that. So hopefully we have a good answer for that. Uh, Cause earlier in the year, remember it took forever to get Rogers on the field at all. It took everyone begging and pleading to get him out there. And they finally did. So, you know, holding holding people accountable can work apparently sometimes. Yeah, and, and to Gus Bradley's credit, I know we're going to end up talking this whole segment just about this, but Probably. to Gus Bradley's credit, Isaiah Rogers has outsnapped Brandon Face on the last couple of weeks, and he did this yeah. past weekend too. Like Isaiah Rogers had more snaps, even if it didn't feel like it, because every time Brandon Face on was out there, tra- tra- uh, Travis Etienne or whatever was was running for like sixty yards up the sideline, but. <laughs> um, you know, it has to be more. It has to be more than what it is. It, again, right now it is. It's like a. It's like a fifty-five to forty-five split with Isaiah Rogers taking more snaps. This needs to be like eighty to ninety percent split for Isaiah Rogers. Like the, Brandon Faison should not be out there. Uh, if he is out there, it's just to fill in for a couple plays with you know with guys getting gassed or something. But it is time to put Isaiah Rogers out there. He's younger. He's more athletic. He's a playmaker. And he's better in run defense right now. I, I really don't see what the hesitation is there. But, again, let's get to more positive stuff. The Colts have yeah. a really good dilemma at safety right now. Ronnie McLeod can never see the bench. Ronnie McLeod better never come off the field. He is he is a he is a playmaker. He is awesome in the run. He's like he's like Julian Blackman and Kari Willis put together, you know, these last mm-hmm. couple of years. You know, sure tackler, explosive downfield, smart, savvy. Ronnie McLeod's awesome. But – Outside of that, what do you do at safety? You know, Ronnie Thomas the seconds played really well. Julian Blackman's the guy that the team is super, super high on. And Frank Reich even said today that they think he's, you know, an outstanding young player that they want out there. And then you have third rounder Nick Cross, uh, you know, yeah. who has not really seen the field at all, even though he had a fumble recovery uh, this past game, uh, technically in the in the stats book yeah. <laughs> on that last play. Uh, but Julian Blackman and Ronnie Thomas the second, like, what do you do with that kind of rotation? When, when Blackman is, you know, 100% and he's finally back. Yeah, and I, th- I think what you got to do is just find the role, it would, whichever one either guy performs at the best. I think for Thomas, you probably give him, I guess, looks at the at deep safety. G- give him obvious passing, downfield passing down type of stuff. Blackman can be really good coming downhill. Uh, so he can be better in run support. I just think that that's all they got to do. They have to find ways to get both of them involved, but put them out there situationally because Blackman is going to have a role. They're not going to they're not going to take him out of the lineup altogether. But Thomas has earned a permanent role. Like yeah. he's got to get snaps as well. I mean, something. just think of how many big plays he saved. You got to have you got to have something for him out there. Right, and I'm going to rudely interrupt like I was about to there, but I'm going to fully really <laughs> rudely interrupt wow. here. <laughs> no, but something I think is really interesting is is Gus Bradley did run a decent amount of dive or dive of dime last year, a decent mm-hmm. amount of dime last season, where he would have three safeties, you know, on the field at once. This year, on even on third and long, you know, third and fifteens, third and sixteens, and stuff like that, we've only seen nickel. 
it's been Zaire Franklin and Bobby Okereke both out there. And I think both those players have been playing really well. But I would love to see some more dime where, you know, you have situations where you have Bobby Okereke in the middle, you have Julian Blackman and Rodney and Rodney McLeod on the sides, and then you have Rodney Thomas deep. I think that would be the best third down package yeah. you can have. Anything that's like third and eight plus, I would love for that to be the package. So we'll see if that's what happens going forward. I I don't know if I'm super optimistic about that, but I do want to see these three safeties all getting some playing time because Ronnie Thomas the second has proven that he needs playing time. He's he's played really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I guess if we're finding something for Nick Cross, um, goal line red zone has been his specialty at least in the preseason. So because I mean that that's a guy who they think has you know star ability to him. Yeah. So you got to get him some developmental snaps as well. Yeah, he's young. He's he's what twenty one now. Like. There is no rush to get him out there. There's no rush to to make him that star player right now. Uh, and while Rodney McLeod is playing this well, you don't need to throw Cross out there. So I think this is the best case scenario for Nick Cross. Yeah, for sure. I think that's it for us, everyone. We'll be back with you tomorrow to start focusing on the Titans in Week 7. It's another chance at redemption for the Colts like they just got on Sunday. Yeah, make sure you guys follow us on social media at JakeArthurNFL, at ZachHicks2, and at LockedOnColts, all on Twitter.com. Also, subscribe to our shows on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast. Thanks again for making Locked On Colts your first listen every day. Now make your second listen to Peacock and Williamson NFL Show. Brian Peacock and former NFL scout Matt Williamson give you the expert NFL analysis in less than 30 minutes. It's free and available wherever you get your podcast. We'll see you guys tomorrow.